yeah. just give him a call. We're 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 really <laughs> we're really excited about this. Uh, and uh, yeah, so should give him a ring. Let's talk to our local boy. This is a flat out fever podcast, by the way. I don't think we said that. <laughs> no, we have said top. That. Uh, we did actually. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. okay. Cool. I made sure. All righty. Mike's we're on calling. top of everything. Skype. Skype is amazing. Isn't it brilliant? It's 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 awesome. It's the future. It is the future. Is now. Let's just you know hope it goes through. Would you would you? This is hilarious. Would you like to leave a video message? You like to leave a, a message? It's like an answering machine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll just. Uh, We'll wait well, up for a well, minute. we'll give it a minute. My we'll parents used to have an answering machine that had two miniature audio cassettes in it. One of them was the recording that says, oh, we're not home right now. Yeah. Please leave your name message and we'll call you back whenever we we get home. And then the other, <laughs> and then the other one recorded and it would be like, <laughs> it made these crazy noises. It, it knew where all the messages were somehow. On cassettes, cassette That's tapes. On, yeah, on cassettes, on no less. You know, like maybe message him and be like, "Yo." <laughs> so how fun was F one at Betty's this weekend? <laughs> one, yeah, one, of, one of the oh, few, yeah. one of the few live races that we are allowed to, or not allowed, but able, I guess, allowed because bars can't serve alcohol or open before eleven. That's Otherwise, true. we could have done a few more live ones this year, but yeah, one of the few live. Events that we events host. that we that we could uh, show this year Sorry. or watch even watch. I Sorry, only saw I maybe stream health things. One second. Sorry guys, it seems like we're having some uh, some technical difficulties. Uh, please, internet's being lame. <laughs> yeah, that was maybe the third or fourth race that I've seen live the whole season. Montreal, we were there. Oh yeah, we were there. We were we were in person. This one, there were one or two uh, i could i couldn't even tell you which one one or two where i woke up at three four five in the morning and watch and them. watch them yeah and watch them again at betty's but no that was fun and thank you for everybody that did show up to betty's uh, ah, this so weekend fun. we will be doing it obviously again for the mexican grand prix we do try to like do these especially when they when they go live uh on our time zone uh and just to give everybody an update See, i was telling a buddy of mine about it like you, sh you should show up like like come, yeah it could come out like here, here's the time here's the date come on he's like oh i don't know i don't know people there and stuff but it's it's kind of like going to the movies like i don't know everyone that shows up you don't know all the people that show up <laughs> it's kind of like going to the movies but like everyone really wants to see this movie mm -hmm. you know I mean, we're all there for the same reason people start cheering when stuff happens the room starts going crazy cheering yeah it's fun how, how like are we doing mike mini stadium <laughs> atmosphere almost like a movie sorry about that um adobe um uh, uh, Adobe Creative Cloud is like a really weird program that like it constantly clocks in. Yeah, yeah, yeah and so I yeah, left yeah. it on that computer. Oh, there we go. We're back in green. Yeah, should All be right. good to go. Other computers taking over the whole internet. Yeah. Screwing around. I'm gonna try and call him again. Yeah, let's give it a shot. Tell that other computer to relax. In the other over there in the living room. Hello? Hello. Hello. Nicholas Latifi. Hey, Good morning. Good afternoon. Hey, guys. How's everybody? Very well. Thank you. How are I'm you? Doing great. How are you? Yeah, I'm all good. Thanks. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, perfect. Can, can you hear you. us? Yeah, I hear you guys. Wow, all. Actually, awesome. hang, hang, hang in there, Nicholas. I, uh, I don't think the volume is like way up for, for this. I mean, I can, I can hear him only faintly. That might be your thing. You should be okay. fine. Yeah, it could be fine. Okay. Nicholas, uh, uh, I am Javier. Danny. And I'm Mike. And uh, we are the hosts of the Flat of Fear podcast, uh, podcast based in uh, your hometown of Toronto. Thank you very, very much for giving us this opportunity to chat uh, and making a break in what must be a very busy schedule. Yeah, I have a bit of a uh, bit of time off right now with you, my last race. So yeah, my pleasure to come on this podcast with you guys. Oh, that's awesome! Thank, Thank you very much. So cool. Yeah. Uh, so you Thank were you just much. recently in Austin, Texas. Yes. How was, was that? There, uh, yeah, so it was um, actually only the, the the second Grand Prix I've been to when I've uh, 
not been racing myself this year. Obviously, mm. GP2 does does half the, the races with Formula One. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was nice to have another opportunity. Uh, obviously, the other Grand Prix I went to was Canada. Canada. Uh, so it was nice to have an opportunity just to be, be in the background, uh, just kind of like learn and observe, uh, you know, take part in all the, the, the let's say, the, the pre-session briefings with the team, kind of get to figure out how they how they, uh, let's say, set the program, all the debriefings, see how the drivers interact with the engineers, and just work with the whole team because really it's it's quite a bit different to uh, any other junior Formula racing just with the sheer volume of people that <laughs> Formula 1 drivers have to work with. Yeah. So it's uh, interesting to see, and it's actually surprising how much you learn just from you know being in the background. 100%. Actually, I wanted to ask you about that. Uh, Mike, can you pull up that picture? I'm, I'm highlighting it right now on the book. Yeah. Um, yeah, we saw you out on the the track walk. Yeah, so you were doing a track walk from like with one of our favoriteest drivers in Formula One right now, Jolyon Palmer. How's J- how's J how's J Pal going on right now? How, <laughs> how how is he? Is he a fun guy to talk to or what? What's going on there? Yeah, he's he's a really nice guy actually. Um, I've uh, e- even before he was in Formula One, I had. Uh, uh, we're not let's say like close close uh, friends, but you know, I, I we we've known each other for. Uh, like I said, a few years. He also raced with the uh, the GP2 team that I'm currently with. He won yes. the championship with them. Yeah. Uh, so I've seen him on a few separate occasions. Yeah, he's a really nice guy. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. No, I I, I really like him as a commentator. Um, but <laughs> here we're showing a picture. Uh, Mike, can he can he? See? So, uh, I don't know. Oh, if yeah, you guys... can... yeah. Yeah. So this picture right now it shows you just off to the right there, and I, I just something that you said right now like really is something that I, I I've been curious because. It must be one of the biggest uh, uh, shock factors, if anything, or like biggest cultural differences going from somewhere like GP2 or any of the junior formula to F1. And all of a sudden you're surrounded by so many people and everybody's watching what you do and you have to interact with so many more people than before. Um, I, like was that crazy to even like you know I, I, obviously you're there as part of one of these people that that are effectively Julian Palmer's entourage in this picture but um like like how was how is that atmosphere like from a from a driver's perspective like you 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 have your communications person your PR person there uh like I, I, that must be that must get hectic yeah so obviously it's uh I guess if you're jumping straight into a to a race seat, let's say from straight from a junior formula, it can be a bit overwhelming with how many people. So actually, uh, everyone wearing the yellow shirts except me is that are actually uh, engineers on just Jolian's car. So Kevin oh, Magnuson, the other driver, has has his own set of uh, engineers as well, and then on top of that, there's all the mechanics. So and GP2 and in uh, other junior formulas, Formula Three, Formula Three Point Five, you ma- you mainly have two guys, two engineers that uh, you work with. You have your race engineer and your performance engineer. And F one, you see how many more engineers <laughs> there are, and they all have their own role. That's like their own job uh, for a specific part of the car. So, wow. you know, you you do have your main race engineer, which is who the driver is, let's say, in contact with the most. But but everybody will constantly be coming through to ask certain things about the session, wanting your feedback. Uh, though be, throughout the session, they'll always be relaying information to the race engineer uh which he'll then relay back to julian because when you're driving you don't want 20 different people talking to you on the radio you just want your <laughs> your, yeah. your one race engineer and then uh so all of the information will get funneled through him right you but don't, yeah, you don't uh, want like a broken it, it, telephone it's a bit overwhelming i guess like and, and this is one of the reasons why i think it's good that um you know i'm able that uh, i'm able to experience this now while i'm not in let's say in the race seat obviously my goal is to get the formula one that's what i'm working towards but uh to experience this and at least be exposed to it while not having the the pressure of being in the race seat i think is uh right. something very good and beneficial now that guy all the way off to the right who looks like uh fake nico rosberg <laughs> <laughs> what, what's he doing he looks like he's trying to block his face so you guys don't look at him <laughs> Like, um, the picture is actually is not very clear, so if I, uh, I can't see the face, but if I have to guess, I think that's Julian's uh, that's Julian's friend okay, and so the uh, trainer. Oh, okay, people in the people with the black shirt are not officially part of the team, but they're part of the the weekend crew. <laughs> can you see it better now? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's, still, it's still team kit, which is good. <laughs> just uh, just different color. <laughs> cool. Um, I, I have one of those black too. I just chose not to wear it. <laughs> Renault is obviously right now a very interesting team because uh, their position right now in the Formula One pack, let's, let's say somebody just got into F1 
uh, with absolutely no 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 knowledge of motorsports before, and they look at where Renault is right now, and they're 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 further down than what their potential is. Let's put it right. that way, because they are a manufacturer team. They make their own engines. They supply other teams with with engines. So it's a team that, as far as anybody can tell, they're just sort of in a rebuilding phase because they had they just committed back to F1 for the long term this year, and then they've had to like work out some kinks, and they're still clearly in that process but it's a team that has a long future which is why honestly when we found out that uh you signed with them as a test driver we covered it here on the podcast and we're very excited because we like we as 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 you do i'm sure uh, as well can tell that Renault is going places and mm -hmm. and as a as a long-term bet they they do seem like quite a reasonable bet um uh, nico hulkenberg just got signed with them do you like is is that the kind of environment that you saw at the team there while hanging out with them that is is everybody really just focusing on on a long-term future and like really like they're thinking ahead to not not necessarily even next year but in two or three years time challenging for wins challenging for a championship yeah for sure i think that's the goal um it was always going to be a, a transitional year for them this year obviously they took over uh the, the Lotus, Lotus team very late last year and pretty much started from the exact same car that Lotus ended off last year, which you know wasn't uh, wasn't the most competitive. Um, mm -hmm. So they started, let's say, from uh, from last year's car with not really any development. And for sure, in the first part of the year, they were uh, bringing some developments. But for the most part, um, they switched quite early their focus to the 2017 car. Yeah. Obviously, in 2017. Uh, there's a very big uh, rule change for the cars, and the, the wider tires, the well, you know wider wings are going to be much quicker, probably around uh, four to five seconds a lap quicker, mm -hmm. uh, just off uh, mechanical and aero performance because the engines are regulations are pretty much the same. Uh, so it was always going to be a transitional year, and for sure, they're uh, uh, you know they're, they're a team that's going to have great potential because, like you said, they are a full manufacturer team now. They've been making en their engines for. A, uh, for a while, and now obviously, when you combine both the engine making and chassis making in house, for sure, uh, yeah, for, for sure, it's a big advantage. Yeah, absolutely. So, I guess you're you're in Austin all weekend, checking out the city, seeing the sights, enjoying the weather. I was I was a bit confused on the TV because like they kept saying how hot it was. It's really hot here. So many people wearing pants and jackets, <laughs> and also. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, the weather was a bit strange in the, in the mornings. Well, in the in the mornings it was quite cold, uh, and I, I, well, I, I it was cold for me. I wanted to wear a jacket. <laughs> and then, yeah, soon, and I'm from Canada, so if I'm putting on a jacket, then I'm cold. <laughs> everybody, everybody else is uh, in trouble. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and and also, um, and then, yeah, and then in the middle of the day, it just would just warm up, right? So uh, yeah, it was a bit bit strange, but uh, it, it, it wasn't too hot actually. It wasn't too hot. The, Ideal conditions for driving. About about Austin itself, I saw, I saw your uh, your your vlog that you posted of the down. Your, your hotel was downtown, right? Yep, downtown. So I hear all these uh, sayings like Austin is like the Tor the the Toronto of America. It's America's <laughs> Toronto. It's a similar culture, that kind of stuff. But looking looking out your window there in your in your video, <laughs> I didn't really get that impression. No, definitely, I agree with you. I, I'm, I'm not sure who said that, but I don't agree with them. <laughs> no, I, you know what I think it is. I think I think they're talking about like just the amount of the population that's composed entirely of hipsters. <laughs> hipsters, yeah. <laughs> uh, Independent uh, beers and barbecue. A lot of band spots, I guess. Uh, uh, that, that, that might be true. Yeah, honestly, I didn't get to. Um, uh, I didn't get to explore so so much downtown. Uh, like for the most part, they're like full days, uh, yeah. full days at the track. Um, obviously, I'm staying downtown. Yeah, went to right. a few different uh, restaurants to eat, most of which were steakhouses because <laughs> obviously, uh, in, in, in Texas, that's really yeah. the the only thing you can go for, and you're, you're sure you're gonna get good quality. Yeah, you don't you don't steaks. go to Texas to get a salad. <laughs> no. <laughs> We're like, yeah, should we go for like a nice Italian? It's like, no, 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 no it's no, probably gonna be no. average here. <laughs> You're in Texas, you gotta eat steak. <laughs> yeah, um, for sure, you're supposed to spend all your time at the track, right? Yeah, well, that's what you're there for. If if GP2 had a had a race in the states, like you would have otherwise been there driving yourself, obviously. Um, and yes, and, and but 
on the weekends when that does happen, and, and I don't know if everybody is familiar with this or not, but GP2 was basically a series that was designed from the get-go. After the fall of Formula 3000, uh, Bernie Ecclestone basically got uh, together with Flavio Briatore and they said, we got to like streamline a further, like a way to get into Formula 1. And they came up with the concept of GP2 and GP3 as as the the, the premier the feeder, feeder series. series into F1 and 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 that's why they also go together so well as as a backup series during during the events mainly in Europe and sometimes the Middle East and Asia um but what is what is that like for you guys because you have uh in GP2 you have two races you have that the, the, the sprint race and the feature race and that is all going on at the same time as the F1 cars are going around and 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 the whole circus is happening like what's what's that environment like, like I, I, are you guys when the uh, when the when the F1 guys are around like are you guys kind of treated like okay like here's the GP2 guys here's the F1 guys you know like, clean the podium real quick like hurry up with your GP2 podium ceremony here's the F1 guys coming <laughs> How is that? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think one of the things that makes GP2 and GP3, let's say, attractive to drivers, uh, att that, that makes drivers want to race in those championships is the fact that you're in the Formula 1 paddock. You're, you're under, like, the, the microscope of all the Formula 1 mm. teams, um, which is... And obviously the atmosphere of a, of a Formula 1 race weekend, right? You're, you're, you're in the show. Well, we're the support race to the show, yeah. but you're still uh, in the show. So, yeah, yeah it's... Uh, um, you know, you, you definitely feel sometimes that... Um, Sometimes the organization like will make it clear that you know you're not the show, and uh, just like, for example, <laughs> little things like uh, you know there's little delays in, in let's say certain sessions or like these rain delays yeah. um, you know, for Formula One. You know they'll really like you know adjust the schedules, but like sometimes they could uh, you know cancel one of our races on one day and put it the next day or, or shorten a practice depending on if there's too many like in malaysia for example we had 15 minutes less to practice just because of the, the scheduling i guess there was a bunch of other support races mm. which for me i didn't really uh i don't really like because i mean we're all we're going all the way to malaysia we already don't get a lot of track time uh yeah in tp2 and they showed in the practice session by 15 minutes <laughs> and we even drove a day earlier so for me it's like okay we're going all this way <laughs> and you're taking practice away from us but again it's because formula one is is the show rightly so? Yeah. So uh, you, know, you, you definitely feel sometimes that you're <laughs> you're there to support them. But yeah, the whole atmosphere, I have to say, it's um, um, you know compared to the other series I raced in, I I spent two, uh, two years in the FIA Formula Three European Championship, and we obviously support many of the DTM races. And DTM is you know like the Formula One of uh, let's say GT racing, sedan racing, uh, which they get some races that can get just as many people there. So those weekends are cool as well. But Formula One, you just you really feel the that atmosphere and that vibe. And depending on uh, which races you go to, obviously we got we get to race at Monaco that's you know just completely right. over yeah. the top um uh, you know uh abu dhabi at the end of the year I, i've raced there before in, in gp2 that's a crazy one too we get to do a night race and pretty much any race where you're gonna get a bunch of fans yeah. silverstone the stands were packed and again for uh, for us to race there in, in that environment it's uh mm. it, it definitely makes a bit of a difference and it's something really cool to be a part of you know something that i found uh, <laughs> like funny and cool at the same time uh when uh when it was the first time for everybody at baku earlier this year oh, that's uh, i was just gonna say the exact same yeah, thing yeah so um it i i found it funny that the f1 drivers were, were commenting over and over again how everybody was watching you guys because yeah. you guys were basically the next best thing to f1 but it was the circuit was new to everybody, so everybody was watching like the kind of lines that you were that you were taking. Like, like how how was that? How was hitting the a brand new grade A certified FIA track before the F1 cars? And separately, because I think it got lost over that weekend through the broadcast, and people are like, "Oh, Baku sucks." Whatever. whatever. <laughs> how was it being there? Like, how was the city, the food, the people, or whatever? Like, how how's Baku? Yeah, okay, so I'll answer that question first. Um, so, yeah, obviously, um, Baku, it, it, it's a city that you could tell it's like, you know, the, the whole city is kind of being like modernized and like rebuilt. Like, there's really so old. many big buildings under construction. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, 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 was, it was quite a nice city, actually. Um, you know, weather was obviously nice, it was hot. Um, we were, at least where the track was, it was close to the water, so that was nice. Uh, and you know the so from that regard, I I think it was quite okay. Uh, I I think we're going to be going back there next year in the GP2, so I'm nice. looking forward to that. Speaking about the the track itself, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So 
normally on a on a race weekend, uh, F1 will always drive one session before we drive. So they're kind of like the the track cleaners, let's say. Yeah. <laughs> just, just, no, m most of the tracks are you know they're, they're proper racing circuits. So you know for Formula One, they probably would have sweeped them down already. Obviously, Baku is a street track, yeah. and it's a brand new street track. <laughs> so. <laughs> It, obviously, us having to do the first session there for them, we were the we were track cleaners, the first ones to drive and experience the track. <laughs> yeah, obviously, it's uh, it, it was it was quite special. I know I always enjoy driving street tracks. I I love street tracks. It's some of my favorite tracks uh, to drive. Um, but obviously, when you're the, the first one, there's still like you know candy wrappers on the track, a lot of dust. <laughs> and, uh, it, it definitely makes it a bit more challenging, especially when you're driving around and like dust is rooster tails of dust are flicking off the car in front because uh, this, it, it hasn't been properly <laughs> sweeped. Uh, you know, it, it definitely changes uh, changes the game a bit. But, you know, the, the race, the track itself, um, you know, obviously it's get up to very high speeds, has the longest straight or the longest, let's say, uh, area where you're flat out because there are some corners in the straight, but you just take them flat out. Uh, and then to race, uh, well, yeah, I, I mean, if you guys watch the GP2 races, and I think that those are the GP2 races that got kind of the most attention out of anyone this year, yeah. just because of the sheer carnage that happened. Yeah, there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it was great to watch. <laughs> Cars going yeah. like almost uh, two stories high. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, I didn't get to experience the first one because I got involved in a first corner accident. Uh, and, and, and yeah, in the first corner of the first race, so I think it's unfortunate that. But uh, I think yeah, only half the field finished that one. Yeah, and I was even gonna the say like I, I was like a, everybody got into that. an accident. That <laughs> yeah. Like li literally, if you just kept your nose clean and didn't, even if you weren't fast, even if you were one of the slowest cars on track, you kept your nose clean, you were gonna finish in the points in that first race because so many people like <laughs> fast made mistakes or got hit out or, and uh, yeah, it was just uh, it was a bit of a laundry that race, and especially with the long straight. You know, it was so difficult to, yeah. to pull away, especially with the DRS effect. And then we had the, all the shenanigans with the safety car restarts, oh, yeah. which created uh, really big accidents. And uh, it was really actually quite dangerous, especially the second uh, race that I was that I was in. Uh, you know, the, the front driver accelerating and then braking and then causing big pileups and stuff behind. That's uh, mm. on a street track. That's not something you really want to be no, <laughs> be a no part way. of, especially when you have nowhere to, to go. So that was a bit scary. But mm. uh, you know, I, I enjoyed the. Let's say I didn't enjoy. Uh, the end result because I didn't finish in the points in either race, but uh, <laughs> the experience was, was quite cool because I, I like racing on street tracks. Nice. Yeah. Cool. I got th the final question, I guess, in the same vein is uh, so Renault brought you to, to Canada to have the whole weekend experience there, but Canada for next season in F1 is one of the two races that's uh, not fully confirmed yet. Question mark, right? Because of the facilities and all that. Like, so. Are the facilities really that bad? Like you, sp you were in the pits. You, you probably walked through the paddock club and whatever. Yeah, what's, what's so bad about this? What's so bad about it? I know they don't have a real medical facility, and there's one or two things that could be spruced up. But or is it, is just it really that, like, that bad? Or is it just that the buildings are from the '70s and they like everything to be? Yeah, is, is Bernie just uh, one of those? Just that snobby. <laughs> <laughs> I think the main thing um, with Montreal compared to let's say the other F1 tracks is really just the space uh the space in the paddock so like the garages are are okay like you know when once the teams organize all their let's say their specific equipment you know you put you, you put the camera in the Renault garage in Montreal and you put the camera in the Renault garage in any other track it's most likely going to look the same with the exception of Monaco that you're really limited on space yeah. but mm -hmm. I, I think the main thing is the the actual paddock behind where there's really not a lot of room and also like the the, the space for the hospitalities, so like the hospitalities, for the team hospitalities, right. not the paddock club and that stuff. The team hospitalities are, are the smallest out of any track in, in Montreal just because there's literally, like, th there's no space. Obviously, you have that uh, that, that waterway that runs just behind the, the paddock, and I'm right. pretty sure they were supposed to ex expand the paddock into that waterway to oh create God. much more room. And, you know, from, let's say, having, uh, from being able to experience other paddocks, for sure, I think it's something that they, they should uh, they should address making the paddock bigger. I don't see it as a reason to to not go back there because Montreal is one of the best Grand Prix on the yeah. uh, on the calendar. Yeah, I, I know on, many man. drivers w love the track, and I know many drivers that's one of their favorite Grand Prix to go to just because of the atmosphere there. You know, it's right downtown, yeah. which you don't get with a lot of tracks. A lot of tracks you got to drive, you know, an hour and a half, two hours into the middle of nowhere yeah. and into <laughs> uh, the farmland, which uh, you know. 
the, it, it's not it, it sounds nice from the outside that you get to say oh yeah i'm uh, going to go race in england but you're not racing in london you're racing no, in yeah. silverstone which is uh <laughs> quite a bit in the middle of nowhere so uh, a lot of times it can sound much nicer than it actually is but montreal is one of those races where you're, you're in this the, the the heart of the city which is nice and you get you know tons of passionate motor racing fans i think it was like one of the only grand prix that I saw that on the Friday practice days that some of the grandstands were completely full. Yeah. Mm. So I hope uh, the Grand Prix goes back there. I definitely don't want to see that removed, not just because I'm Canadian, but yeah. because I think it really is one of the best Grand Prix on the calendar. It is. Yeah. Of course. It's a, it's of a course. lot of fun. Oh, actually, so you, you just mentioned something about DRS, and correct me if I'm wrong, but DRS only made it to GP2 this year, right? Uh, no, last year. Oh, last well. year. Last year. Sure, yes. Were you there to like witness the change? Like, how much, like, how different was that? Like, now driving with DRS versus not DRS? So, honestly, uh, in terms of lap time, uh, you know, the DRS will probably give you around maybe half a second hmm. advantage compared to non DRS to DRS lap times. Um, you know, obviously, we only use it in the straights, so it's not something that uh, you know we really have to get mm. get used to. You're just approaching some corners with a bit of a higher top speed. The main thing that I feel has changed uh, is there is the okay. Obviously, it's made it easier to overtake. Mm. So for sure, uh, you know, the racing aspect is a bit different in terms of strategy. But the one thing that I find uh, uh, it, it changes a bit in the way you have to manage the races because obviously. When you're within the second gap of the car in front, you have the DRS, and in GP2 the DRS is quite uh, quite a big advantage. You know, all the engines are the same, so you don't have the difference between like an F1 between the Ferrari, Mercedes, Renault, Honda engine. Where sometimes you can see, you know, if the Honda gets the DRS, it's it's not going to make such a big difference to a Mercedes powered car, or uh, you know, you see that sometimes in the Formula One races. So all our engines are the same, so it really and it really has a, a quite a big effect because without it, it was you know quite difficult to overtake unless um, you know someone's tires massively dropped off in, uh, in performance. So the way you have to manage the races now is completely different because it's so effective. Most likely, if you are quicker than the car in front, even a few tenths, most likely you will pass them. Where in the past, you have to have like be like a second quicker than the guy to even have a chance of passing, just because you know, it's so difficult to pass with with these kind of uh, Formula cars. So the way you manage the race right from the get go is different because you really have to push much more than you did in the past around the whole track because without the DRS before you were able to you know save your tires and like let's say infield sections and just make sure you get a good exit out of the, the corner that leads onto the straight now you can't do that because if the guy's close onto that last corner onto the straight even if you get a good exit he's going to pass you down the straight because he has the benefit of DRS. Oh, so you have to push to try and maintain that gap the whole track and the way you manage the tires now becomes much more difficult because you're forced to push much more <laughs> yeah no doubt <laughs> that, that, that's that, that, that's pretty interesting and i guess that's why drs when it made it to f1 and it, it got some criticism people accused it of you know being artificial but it the result the end result from i guess from a from a viewer's point of view is that it, it has increased overtaking so i can see do you remember the first year though when drs first came to f1 the first year they were allowed to use it in qualifying anywhere on the track yeah, that was cars insane. were that was fishtailing insane. all over the place <laughs> and drivers were almost in tears about how scary it was but they had to do it to compete yeah. that was amazing oh. i say go yeah, back i remember like some some tracks they would be yeah, flat out corners like without drs but then as soon as you put the drs they become a bit borderline yeah, yeah. and I, was, I got to experience let's say <clears throat> that kind of driving when i did the formula 3.5 oh, because yeah. they have a drs system as well uh not nearly as efficient as effective as gp2 and uh, the f1 because the the way it actually like let's say works is it doesn't flip the rear flap up it just kind of closes the gap between the upper element and lower element mm -hmm. which just speaking simply it just stalls the wing so right. it, it, it just stops working the wing as well as it should um so it wouldn't make as big a difference but you definitely feel it and in that series too we were allowed to use, use in practice anyway. qualifying the, the drs wherever you wanted so as soon as you, <laughs> you were full throttle wheel was straight even if you're turning a bit still, you're putting the DRS on. Even some corners, yeah. like for example, uh, in Spa or Rouge, you're going flat out Whoa. there with the DRS. With the DRS. Whoa! <laughs> That's scary. That sounds in, amazing. <laughs> in, uh, yeah, I, I, the first corner, you're flat out with the DRS. So it's uh, it becomes a bit sketchy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've tried it on the video game. It's terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> Even just digitally. Um, going back to, to Austin and I guess your role at Renault as a test driver, um i guess from like from from a from an outside perspective like 
we know that you guys do, I guess, some 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 in car testing. Uh, we saw that you went to uh, somewhere in Belgium and 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 whipped out one of the V8s. Uh, and yeah. I guess, yeah. Actually, first, how like how loud are those things, man? They're awesome. <laughs> Yeah, no, they're they're amazing. It's uh, obviously I, I haven't driven one of the hybrid cars, so um, you know, the, the fact that the car I did drive was the, was the V8 was was quite nice. Obviously, yeah. specifically speaking about Spa, you know, that's one of the reasons we we brought that car was because you know we know that's what the fans like. Yeah, uh, and, and you know the proper test days that I have done with the team, they've been in that car, so for sure it's it's something nice to drive, and, um, and it's you know more similar to to the GP2 car because now the GP2 cars are louder than than, than the, the F1, Formula yeah. One cars. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. Right. But yeah, so on top of, of top of that kind of stuff and like maybe some simulator work, like what kind of like you know like just just to give a, a glimpse to, to to the fans, like what is what does it consist of? Like the job of being a test driver, like do you, do do you go to Enstone at Enstone Enstone a lot? Yeah. Um. So yeah, the, the role is uh is mainly to help with with my development. So mm-hmm. um, like I said, I haven't driven the actual uh, current year car yeah. because obviously you can't just test the car whenever you want. Mm-hmm. Uh. But uh, the the only um, you, if you want to do a test day in a car like I've done, you have to take uh, take a car that's two years older than the current year. Uh, so we chose to do the test days in the 2012 car. So technically, I could drive be driving a 2014 car, which wasn't a great car for for the Lotus. I have a lot of problems, but uh, we we chose to do it in the 2012 car. So I had done a few test days in that. So that was a big part um, of the role to help with my development and also to give me more track time and parts, let's say in, in the season where uh, there's big breaks in the GP2 calendar. Like for example, in Mon- in between Monza and Malaysia, I did a test day in that, which was good because it was a month break with, with no driving. And that's not such a, such a good thing, especially in GP2 when you're already limited and don't have a lot of track time. Besides that, um, yeah, I've spent some time uh, at Enstone uh, especially at the beginning of the year, I have another uh, session coming up uh, for some simulator, um, and that's just you know helping the team a bit with anything they, they want to test. Most of the time on the simulator, they'll be doing a lot of let's say correlation mm. um, running, which basically they'll they'll try something in the, uh, they'll have something they try on the car in real life, whether it's a setup change or uh, or, or a new suspension system, what what have you, and then they'll try it on the simulator, and they want to make sure they kind of get similar data, similar readings, because if you do that, then you know, you know, the correlation is good, and you you have more confidence to test things on the simulator and know that it's what result it's going to have on the real car. So that's something quite important. Um, and then also, yeah, like I did in Austin, like I did in Montreal, I've gotten to go to a few races, and it's just an opportunity for me to learn. Uh, yeah, learn and be in the background and see how you know a Formula One team operates, what's expected of the drivers, how they interact with the engineers, uh, and vice versa. Because again, it really is you know I, I said it before, but it really is a completely different world yeah. to uh, to GP2. So again, all, all these things just to help, let's say, further my development is 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 the main let's say uh, thing that comes with my test driver role. That's really yeah. exciting. I just wanted to say like the, uh, it's really exciting for you, obviously, right? Because I, th- I feel like when people think of testing, it's like one of these things like, oh, no, you're testing new equipment or like new specs for a car or something like that. But to me, I guess someone who's no- new to Formula One in the whole world that it is, uh, I think that's really exciting. Sorry. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> exciting. And yeah, it's a it's a good opportunity for me. Uh, I know you said at the beginning of the the podcast that, you know, it's a, it's a full manufacturer team and it's a mm-hmm. team that has a, you know a lot of racing uh, pedigree and, you know, has a great history in the sport. So to me... Um, not only just with a Formula One team, but a Formula One team like Renault that has this history for sure is right. uh, is something quite special as well. Uh, on, on that same line, like we always hear a lot of questions for for drivers and stuff. Like, what's your physical regimen like? What what are you eating in the at night? Like, how far do you have to jog? How much weight can you lift? <laughs> All that kind of stuff. But I want to know about the mental training, like. Do you do like the two-handed yo-yos? You practice juggling? Can you ride a unicycle? Do you do you need like kind of ba- like balancing practice or like reaction times? So, how, how do you practice? So I don't know how to juggle. Uh, I've tried juggling many times. I don't know how to juggle. I don't know how to ride a unicycle. But uh, <laughs> um, yeah, there, there obviously is an aspect to the mental side of things. Um, you know, okay, the, the, the obviously the, I would say the physical aspect is always something that's. Um, underrated let's say from fans and, and spectators you know it is very physical to drive especially the cardio you know, for sure speaking sure. about our cars the gp2 we don't have power steering which makes it which is the one thing that makes it let's say if anything a little bit more difficult than formula one obviously our races aren't as long we don't have as high g forces uh, but we don't have power steering so that's as something quite uh, difficult but speaking about the mental side um yeah for, for sure i i think the 
the, one of the main reasons why you have to do some mental training as well, and this could be, you know, uh, you know, mental exercises or like little like cognitive games that you know you you could do like computer games or depending on um, you know where I, I used to train in the first half of the year um, in the Pyrenees Mountains. There was a trainer I was working with, and he had a center up. Uh, up there, and there was many, many tools we used. Uh, some are some are secrets, so I can't mention. Uh, <laughs> but m- m- many tools to you know train your, your you know your focus uh, over long periods of time, your concentration. Obviously, reaction is a big thing. You know, there's many of those. Let's say uh, reaction light systems where you know you're just hitting lights as quick as you mm-hmm. can, and just trying to in- incorporate a bunch of different things. You know, multitasking, memory, while you're still uh, taking part in. And let's say physical exercise and, and stressing yourself physically because you know that's what racing is. You know you're you're exerting yourself physically because you're driving. But there's many other things you have to manage at the same time while not hindering your your driving performance. And obviously that becomes more crucial in Formula One, especially when you see one of the steering wheels they have to work with oh that God. comes with like a, <laughs> a 300 page manual. <laughs> when you see the, buttons of the steering wheel, that's that's one of the things that always. Uh, intrigues most of the fans and spectators especially when they get to see one up close they're like is that really the steering wheel like this looks like a like a video game controller <laughs> uh, so uh so yeah for, for sure it becomes uh much more important uh, when you're in formula one but it already is very important now and especially that again we, we can't drive as much as uh as much as we like that's the one uh, let's say downside to uh to motor racing and especially motor racing at a very high level is the one way you improve anything, whether it's a sport, a skill you want to do, is you mm-hmm. practice, right? The only way you can improve something is if you practice it. This is the one sport where practice is limited and restricted, which is unfortunate. So because of that, it becomes that much more important to be mentally sharp and um, you know, do things that even if it's not actual driving, uh, can help you stay sharp and, and ready that when you do jump back in the car, it's as close as you, as you can to, let's say, not have ever been out of a car. Like for example, I just went uh, uh, this morning. I went karting. I have a KZ shifter cart. Uh, I went karting this morning just to, to stay sharp here in Toronto. A bit cold. Uh, I'll actually, I went up to, to Innisville. So oh, yeah. oh nice, a, a bit, right on. Uh, a, a bit cold, but uh, yeah, it was. Uh, I gotta have a big break in between the the schedule, so uh, you know, just something to try and like, keep if, the if race. If you didn't know, sharp. Centennial Park's got too many laps on Tuesdays. <laughs> 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 I'm, sure, I'm sure you've been there before. <laughs> um, so you're so you're back in town now. Is that, so uh, I, I guess it, it must be hard for you because to compete in Europe all the time. Like, um, you, like, so you probably have like a base in Europe that you spend most of the actual year at, right? Yeah. So I have a place in the, in the UK in Battersea, so where they have the Formula E race. It's quite close to the center of London. Um, honestly, this year I haven't spent so much time there. Reason being is because you know the team I race for is based in France in the, in the Mosse, oh, yeah. where they have the 24-hour race. Uh, so before each each race, I'm obviously spending time there. You know, in the summertime Damn. when the was the European F1 races, they were all crammed into a very short amount of time. So it was a lot of back and forth between races uh, and and the team shop. Mm-hmm. Um, where I was doing my training in the first half of the year was also in France in the Pyrenees Mountains. Um, and when I when there is a really big break in the schedule, like there is now, I like to come come home because I prefer to be uh, on this side of the pond <laughs> than yeah. uh, than uh, than over in, in Europe. Um, so and in the previous years, I did race for a British team, so that's one of the reasons why I had a place mm-hmm. in the UK. But it still is my European base. Uh, but yeah, I definitely like to to come home uh, as much as possible. So out, outside of family and, all, and all, you know the other obvious stuff like like what what what's another thing that you miss about Canada when you're out there? Um the, the main thing that when I come back to Canada is I just try and like um just try to live like let's say more of like a I'm not, not going to say a normal life but do <laughs> things that, I, that that let's say I I can't really do when I'm you know, over there, mm. uh, like like just getting together with friends, going out on the weekends if I'm not racing. Obviously, I still stick to a very rigorous uh, training program, physical training program, and like I said, I do try and uh, keep active with driving various things, whether it's some simulator driving, go karting, things like that. One of the things I also miss too, uh, thankfully, this sport is played in the winter, and that's when I'm home the most. <laughs> is my basketball. I love my basketball. I love my NBA. Oh, nice. I love going to nice. the games. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, this when when the playoffs start is normally when the season st- uh, the racing season starts and picks back up. So yeah. I always end up missing uh, the most exciting part. <laughs> Huge basketball fan. Uh, love to go to as many games as possible. Oh, so you you must be excited because the Raps are actually doing so great. Finally like, doing well. Yeah. 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 Uh, I'm not going to the season opener tomorrow, unfortunately, but I'm going to be at Fridays 
uh, Cavs game, which I'm looking forward to. That's and I'm great. unfortunately I'm not here for the Golden State Warriors game. So again, just a sacrifice I gotta do with my racing. I'm not gonna be here, so <laughs> missing that game. <laughs> going going back to the the racing a little bit, something I've always wondered. You answered the, or you mentioned this like an answer or two back about the power steering. So if you could like for the listeners or for, for myself compare the power steering you don't have any power steering in gp2 formula one has power steering mm. so i've driven before a, like a honda civic with the power steering disconnected and on the opposite end of the scale like i've played like a video game steering wheel with no power steering so where do you rank like an f1 car because you can see on video F- the f1 drivers get some kind of feedback through the wheel mm. like there's some kind yeah. of force there but is it close to zero how heavy is the wheel and how heavy is the gp2 wheel okay so speaking about a, a formula one car yeah obviously there's the power steering so it's electronically a bit assisted um yeah. you can um exactly. well, some teams at least i know um they, they play around with that because you do want some resistance you, want, in the yeah. wheel. you don't you don't want that it's like you know you could just like turn it with one finger and like blow on the wheel and it's going to turn because obviously the main thing you lose with that is the feeling of the car because you know when you play let's say uh video games if you just use a simulator uh sorry a simple you know logitech steering wheel or any kind of basic wheel you get to play uh playstation or i racing xbox game something like that you know the main way you feel the car is the vibration through the steering wheel right uh it's really the only way you can feel the car and that obviously in real life too plays uh plays a big part in how you feel the car and how you react in correct snaps of oversteer and things like that obviously we feel the car through our butts through our uh, <laughs> that are like pretty much sitting on the, the floor of the car so you feel yeah. like that too but when that's one of the things that you let you lose let that say it's a sensation that you lose when you go from a non-power steering to a, a power steering car is uh that let's say that, that feeling and knowing ex- exactly what when the car is going to snap you do kind of feel it but it takes a bit more time to get used to and that's for me is one of the biggest differences in stepping from the gp2 to the <clears throat> to the f1 car now with the gp2 obviously you know we don't have the power steering the wheel gets very very heavy so you know you, I, i'm sure uh, when you drove your I think you said it was the honda civic without the power steering i'm sure you were still able to turn the wheel but i'm yeah. sure it was like very very heavy and it's not something comfortable you, to drive with when you pull uh, into a parking you, spot it's pretty heavy it's like 15 pounds and like a really good yeah. one of the really good logitech wheels will give you eight or nine pounds so how do you compare a gp2 wheel to that so it, it would be much much heavier so, yeah. so in, in terms of uh, okay actual weight I, I, know, I probably wouldn't be able to give you an, an example but the, the one thing is you know the the weight of the wheel will obviously change depending on the kind of how, corner you're going through because in the slow speed corner you have no aerodynamic load on the car so the wheel is still heavy but it's let's say as light as it's going to get whereas when you go through a high speed corner when the the aerodynamics of the car are making thousands of pounds of downforce that are pressing the car into the ground the tires are getting forced into the ground, and you're having to turn that. So, in the, the the faster corner you go through, the much heavier the wheel gets. Especially when you, if you add elevation change, let's say, like Eau Rouge, when you hit the compression mm. in, in Spa and you're going up the hill, it's a flat out corner, very very steep uphill. The wheel is probably the heaviest there out of any other track that uh, that we drive. And you know, over an hour long race, it's uh, it becomes uh, quite challenging. Sounds amazing. You're giving me goosebumps. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Oh, hey, anyway, man, uh, I, I, geez, uh, all, all of a sudden I just looked and we've taken up a lot of your time and, and thanks for staying with us. I know that when, right. we talk, <laughs> yeah, when we talk to your guys, I guess we, we, we really only uh, committed to half an hour, but it's been past that. Well, I, I, I guess one thing that I did um, want to ask you is now looking forward to the mm-hmm. rest of the year, uh, you have one more race coming up. And like you mentioned before, that's so that's gonna be at the at, it's b- both seasons, the F1 season and and the GP2 season are gonna end up at the same time. We're pretty much heading towards one of the most contested uh, championships in Formula One. It might not get decided till then. Uh, you're gonna be there. It's gonna be a great party, but you're also gonna have to to to, to show something because it's gonna be the last race. Uh, are you excited? What are your thoughts going into that race? Like, what are you looking forward to? So yeah, obviously I'm very much looking forward to the last race. It's at a track that I really like, and um, it's one of the best Grand Prix. Let's say in terms of the atmosphere you get too, as well. You know, we get to race at night there, which also adds a different element to it. Mm-hmm. But yeah, definitely looking forward to the end of the season. 
Um, you know, for sure it's been, uh, let's say, the season didn't go the way I expected. Mm. I'd be lying if I said uh, – <clears throat> Uh, I, I was happy with the way it gone. I definitely had some higher expectations, but uh, I think the main thing with, you know, the last race of any championship really is you always want to end on a high because, and then obviously you go into a long winter break and most likely our first race won't be until middle of April <clears throat> next year. So that's a, that's a long break, especially if you end on a let's say a, a sour note. So definitely want to want to keep let's say uh, making uh, making steps forward in my learning and development because uh, you know in GP2 you learn something new every race you're constantly getting more experience so really looking forward to that uh, in terms of the F1 yeah like you said I agree I really think the championship is going to go down to the last race I hope it does I hope yeah. so yeah oh man hey, hey, you don't like to see the championship get decided a few races before the end because no. then it kind of takes away the, the a bit of the excitement in the closing race for so sure. I, I, I'm hoping for that, uh, you know, and uh, you know, in, in that regard, I'm let's say just as much a uh, a motor racing fan and just I, I want the same thing as any other normal spectator because you know I, I'm not racing. I, I want an exciting battle down to the end. I want to be on the edge of my seat too, being like, oh my god, like who who's gonna win this? And then obviously it's something that. Uh, <clears throat> You know, uh, always when I see, uh, let's say, the, the champion crowned at the end of the, the year, or maybe it's not at the end of the year, maybe it's during a race, you know, it's something that, you know, gives me more motivation because obviously that's what I'm working towards. That's what uh, that's what my dream is, and that's what I've dedicated a good chunk of my, my life to. So that's uh, also something I'm looking forward to, to see the, the celebrations. Cool. Uh, actually, well, uh, quick question. So you when you're at uh, racing at the same time that F1 is racing, and then whatever you get, uh, you finish your race, and and then you go somewhere. Like, like what what do you do? Like, where do you hang out to like actually watch the F one races? Like with the so with your uh, badge as a competitor, like do they give you like pretty much the same access as anybody else? Can you just pretty much go anywhere and watch the race? Um, no. So actually, with our uh, let's say GP two passes, uh, you know, our paddock passes are different. It's not the same paddock uh, as the Formula One, so it's oh. different area. So actually, we can't. Our passes don't allow us to go in the grandstands and anything because that's a separate ticket, like a ticket like a normal spectator would buy. Yeah. So actually, uh, a lot of times it happens where if we want to watch the race and we just have our GP2 paddock pass, you're at the track, but you're literally just watching the race on TV in the GP2 hospitality. Oh, yeah? So more often than not, and I've done it before, <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's not <laughs> such a good thing, let's say, to, to admit this or say this, but, you know, sometimes the races are better to watch on TV because you, you hear the commentator. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, and, and you see everything, right? So much as, as nice as it is to, you know, actually see the cars going around, especially if you know, okay, you know, if it's your first Formula One race. I Me, mean, I've seen yeah. the cars going around many times, and, and in all honesty, as a fan, sometimes I prefer to watch it on TV because you get to see yeah. more the whole race and understand what's going on. So right. a lot of times, uh, if I'm not flying out of the race Sunday night, which I won't be uh, in Abu Dhabi, I'm probably going to go back to my hotel and watch the race on the TV there. <laughs> <laughs> That's sweet. <laughs> I, was, I was just going to. You're gonna be right across from the tracks, like a two-minute walk. So it's not like I'm <laughs> just saying, "Okay, I'm done with my day. I don't care about Formula One. Let's go." I'm, I'm still gonna be able to hear the cars. <laughs> yeah. I was just gonna ask, but I guess you said it. You're gonna be in Abu Dhabi, right? Yes, I'm gonna be uh, so be in Abu Dhabi, and then obviously, um, you know, our, our postseason testing uh takes place the week after the race so uh so i will be staying uh for another week. So after you, the you race. mentioned like ob uh, obviously you don't get to drive the current year's car during the season because they need it for races and stuff but what do you think about the idea of post abu dhabi all test and development drivers race in abu dhabi <laughs> with the current spec car it, 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 with the current spec car yeah the drive the f1 drivers get out at the podium ceremony whatever whatever <laughs> immediate second race with the test and development drivers current cars I, I think we need to uh propose that idea to bernie <laughs> yeah. let's, let's call him up after the show <laughs> number. Do I... to send the idea over <laughs> <laughs> i'm off <laughs> i'll be the dream man that's that's why you guys like start even to get into this path this this crazy path that it obviously takes uh, uh a certain amount of uh of well, a huge amount of life dedication, commitment a huge amount of yeah like I, we honestly every time that we interview a driver um it, it's just astonishing to see to see like the commitment that you guys have and obviously you have to have it these mm -hmm. days um but it, there's as far as i can tell in terms of having like a normal life you guys don't have much time for that and and 
just just like you said that you, you you come to toronto you just try to do normal people stuff because your life outside of it is just so the opposite of that <laughs> which is great yeah. <laughs> um it, I, i guess another thing is uh so after this year is done uh, you're looking to go back to uh, to gp2 keep uh, i guess working on some skills and then hopefully look forward to a future in f1 by then i'm sure reno would have uh, if anything like you know especially with with the fact that we're not gonna have any more tokens next year we, we everybody's expecting to see a very competitive reno the seats that do become mm -hmm. available when they become available are going to be highly contested so what would you have to say to say uh to uh, uh, a guy like freddy vasser he's thinking of looking to pick up some some new drivers coming up uh, you know in a couple of years time he he knows you but he but there's other people knocking on his door what would you say to make sure that you're the guy that makes it to f1 instead of somebody else honestly uh, a lot of what's going to determine my my future and okay so like you said first of all i will be doing another year of uh, gp2 um most likely staying with the same team um but a lot of what's going to determine my future after that especially my future in f1 hopefully if i have one is going to be my results next year so let's say the the talking i, I would do to, to mr Basser would be you know the best talking would be to get the results on the track because that's what they're going to be looking at he's Absolutely. told me that's what they're going to be uh looking at and it's you know it's most of the time the same with any uh with any formula one team not just with renault with red bull ferrari uh, mercedes you know you got to get the results on track so you know next year is going to be my second full year in the in the championship obviously you have much higher expectations than uh, than this year and you know all, all, always the second year around for, uh you know you see drivers always have much stronger years especially in a championship like gp2 um so yeah obviously there's uh th there's a bit of musical chairs let's say within the formula <laughs> one world right now um uh, which which i which i think is good it's nice to see changes it's, yeah. it's nice to see um you know drivers going to different teams so current drivers going to different teams new drivers entering formula one which which is nice uh keep things fresh and you know not you know obviously the top teams will always most of the time sign their their drivers for like long-term contracts three three-year deals so I, i think that's good for for the excitement of formula one and also for junior drivers like myself trying to get into the sport because you know it gives you let's say uh, it creates opportunities if you know there's always you know drivers getting signed to one-year contracts and it really puts the pressure on everyone to try and be at their best and perform at their best whether you're in gp2 any other category or in formula one because you know your seat can always constantly be at risk because there's always going to be somebody coming through that's going to be working just as hard if not harder to try and kick you out of your seat and then show them what they're capable of yeah Jeez. that's what silly season is all about <laughs> what do you got so, so i guess uh we saw you with uh tim moraney last week oh yeah doing a, doing a little a couple weeks back two weeks yeah. back i guess <laughs> doing a little drive around interview yeah. and it's, it looks like infinity is giving you the keys to one of those it's wondering, yeah, so wondering gave, how uh, it is the that they gave me the keys to a the blue q50 red sport 400 red so i've been sport enjoying 400. my time driving so far because i like... actually didn't have a car here before then so <laughs> Did they give you that for f1 practice it looks like it basically has the reno f1 tech almost <laughs> built it built in <laughs> yeah like it's actually surprisingly a, it's a very nice car to drive surprisingly very fast honestly I was okay. It has a twin turbo, 400 horsepower. And I was really surprised at how fast. Like once the turbo kicks in, you know, it's really, really powerful, which is quite nice. And yeah, the technology in the in the car is is also, uh, you know, I, I like that kind of stuff. I like the high tech kind of gadgets in yeah, the car. So, nice. you know, I, I'm more for that. But you know, the main thing is I'm not carless anymore, which is yeah. which is great. <laughs> no, no more TTC. <laughs> no more. <laughs> it looks like almost like. Uh... Like a step, one step away from a concept <laughs> car. But I was looking at like the Infinity videos yesterday. They're doing some testing and stuff at the at the Nordschleife, at the Green Hell. Have you ever gotten to driven there? To drive there? No, so I've never driven the Nordschleife. Um, I've driven in, in Nurburgring, so the Formula One track, but never around like the the full full Nordschleife. So That's something definitely I uh, I want to do. But before I do that, I would kind of want to have the track memorized because uh, it can become a bit sketchy going <laughs> like, around there. That's what Gran Turismo is most for. Boy. <laughs> uh, it's amazing it's amazing cool
cool. Um, all right, man. Yeah, I, I think we've 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 successfully wasted enough of your time <laughs> already. Um, uh, we're gonna let you go, but before we let you go, um, thank you again so much uh, for uh, for giving us the opportunity to talk. Um, maybe we can say that uh, we'll catch up with you sometime in the future. For sure, yeah, it'll be my pleasure. I enjoyed talking to you guys. How about how about we say and 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 just just to put a little bit of pressure now, we got Lance Stroll to agree to this as well. How about we say we'll see you in Montreal next year for a couple beers? For How's beer? that? That uh, sounds good. One or two beers? If yeah. I can make it out to Montreal, I'd love to be there. <laughs> All right, man. Thanks sounds so good, much. Man. Uh, Thanks a huge a lot. pleasure. Again, for everybody, this is Nicolas Latifi uh, driving for Dams GP2 and uh, Renault F1 uh, test driver. And yeah, proud Canadian and all around great guy. Nikki Lutz. Thanks so much, man. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. See you. Thank good. you. Good luck. Cheers. Have a good afternoon.